say, we need to do something different. And instead of exploiting people for our sport, I would much rather uh, innovate products for the industry that are going to be better for anglers, but that also find those that have been exploited and pay them double a living wage to start breaking some of those cycles. Hello and welcome to episode 107 of the Green Outdoors podcast. My name is Kyle. I'm AJ. I'm Ryan. And we've got Jeff on the line as well. Now, Jeff, he runs two companies. One's called Pivot, one's called Zag, and they're fishing-based companies. And they're not actually even official partners with us, but at the same time, I wanted to have them on the podcast anyways because you've been hearing in the news, you've been hearing everywhere about supply chain issues. And when you hear supply chain issues, you think, I can't get my stuff on time. Why does it take three months for my shirt to come in? What, you know, I can't make this product because of that. Oh, the cost is skyrocketing because of this. But there's also something kind of behind the scenes too, and it's the, the problem that we have with human trafficking. And then you hear, like, uh, I think it was in, Ryan, you might remember this, but I think it's in China where they have, like, the safety net, the suicide nets around the buildings. Oh, Japan. Because the people are so miserable in their work environment that they're jumping out of the building to kill themselves. But now it's just to get fresh air because they bounce them right back up in, and then they're right back to making our phones. Yeah, yeah. China. But, I uh, think it's China. Yeah. I, think, I think he's right now after he's saying the work environment thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's Japan. Yeah. They, um, they do have a suicide problem, though. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, <laughs> nonetheless, there's these terrible things going on, but also uh, human trafficking and basically slave labor is another issue. And in this day and age, it seems like we're always trying to save a buck, save a buck, save a buck. But where this company stands out and where they kind of separated themselves in the marketplace was they took supply chain issues as well as quality into account, but mainly from the from the human – I guess you would say like human – what's the word I'm looking for? Quality of life? Yeah, like of their employees and who they work with, who makes the products, but also the quality of the products. So, Jeff, thank you for joining us today. Um, I appreciate you coming in. Hopefully you don't mind my introduction. I think I did okay. You did great. Good, good, good. So on our end, I wanted to start off by talking about your products and also specifically how they're made. And kind of what sets people apart, or sets you guys apart in the marketplace. Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna start off and just say, you know, after you know 30 years as a guide in the Northwest, uh, you know, observing fish and observing anglers and and what works and what doesn't, uh, we really wanted to start out by being just an innovation company. Look at at how things go and and how they're different. But um, we started out as a fly shop. And I went to go buy the flies. The distributor to those flies looked me in the face and said, hey, you know, don't buy them from me here. Meet me over in Thailand. We'll put you up. We'll show you a good time. What do you like? Little boys or little girls? Proposition me buying flies. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Deep. And it was a huge eye opener because I had heard about exploitation of, of people in the industry. You know, you hear these things until you're impacted personally by it. And that's really what kind of set us off. Like Zoe Angling Group started as Fair Flies. It's, it's, my, it's my first love. Give me an option and I'll pick up a fly rod, but tossing jigs is pretty fun too. Yeah. Uh, so um, that kind of set us out to say, we need to do something different. And instead of exploiting people for our sport, I would much rather uh, innovate products for the industry that are going to be better for anglers, but that also find those that have been exploited and pay them double a living wage to start breaking some of those cycles. So and but, we, real quick, I, w I just want to jump back and summarize for anyone who may have missed that bomb. Um, you went to a, you wanted to start a fly company. So you went yep. to a distributor and said, Hey, I'd like to start this company. This is, you know, I'd like to start making flies. And they said, okay, well, it's going to be way cheaper if you do that over in Thailand. And in order to earn your business, do you like little boys or little girls? What do you want waiting for you when you get there? I mean, it's <laughs> like the most disturbing, like gut right? Like you, you hear yeah. about it on the news, you hear about it in movies, you hear about it in all these things, but you just, the thought that it was like, you were only one weird conversation away from that. Like, at, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, all yeah. he had to do was say, I'm interested in starting this company. And they're like, well, we got the completely different subject thing going on over yeah. here for you, waiting for you. It's like, it, it may, you know, it, how it's like 
automatically assumed that that's where it would go is such a such a weird thing. So you you yeah. you, you heard that and said this has got to change. This cannot be this way. And then that's you talk about the the double living wage, how you guys find your employees, and how you kind of broke the mold with that craziness. So so first off, you know, working in China and working in, in a lot of those parts of the world, um, it's really difficult to get in and make any changes. So we knew we had to do it somewhere else. We've worked in Kenya, Nepal, and India now. Um, and we go in and we work with local people on the ground, people that are already there with a purpose. Um, there's a lot of organizations doing things for uh, making jewelry or apparel that are intentionally what we call part of the Freedom Business Alliance. We're a member of the Freedom Business Alliance. And that is companies who create pro products specifically to create employment for women rescued from sex trafficking. Okay. So we are partnered with them. We partner with people that they have on the ground in these places. And we say, hey, listen, we would like to ed you know teach you. We come and equip. We bring all the tools, all the materials, the supply chain. Here's everything you need to produce products for us and create sustainable employment for the women that are coming out of safe homes in those regions okay and so, uh it it really you know and and we talk about double living you know double double living. most of these places seven dollars and fifty cents would be a living wage the average fly tire makes two dollars and 25 cents a day in a place where 750 would mean that you could have clean water and a door that locks um you know so for us to do that at 15 dollars a day it really doesn't impact as much as you might think, the end the end cost of yeah. the product. Yeah. Oh, so you're saying that the fifteen dollars an uh, a day doesn't destroy you on the on the end just because the value of the dollar goes so much farther in these places. So that fifteen dollars is like to them, it's like making you know hundreds of dollars if you were to live in America. So they're able to get food, water, shelter, a door that locks, like you said, these important things, yeah. and they can do that off fifteen dollars a day, and then when you look at that and you say, "Okay, for the product to end up here, the impact or cost of that isn't that much different per fly for the consumer." Yet you know that they'll feel good about what's happening uh, in the production process. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, how I guess uh, the question I have is: so the the women that are specifically making your products, they're mm -hmm. rescued from human trafficking. Um, I guess how how do you uh, not acquire them but how do you how do you how do you find them in order to get them in the right situation how do they go from sex trafficking to employment with you I guess what is that sure. process like so, so the biggest challenge is after someone is rescued let's say some some group comes over busts down the doors in a brothel rescues these women they go into safe homes the safe homes give them 18 months to land on their feet Okay. Now there's a lot to absorb in here. I won't I won't go into all the gory details of that, but if you can imagine being taken advantage of since you were five years old, mm -hmm. you're now 20, 21 years old. This is all you've known in your life. And now you've got 18 months to completely build a new life right. from scratch. And really it's really, I mean, the safe home provides bed and food, right? Some counseling. Are a lot of but, them fighting addiction? No, you know what? That that is a problem in certain areas of human trafficking, especially here in the U.S. Um, you know, drugs is a big part of it. Their drugs isn't really part of it. Interesting. It, it really isn't part of that story. So they're because uh, I guess the idea behind the drugs is to keep them addicted to that and under control, right? It is. It is. You know what it is? Is it's it's a shame based control. So. In, in shame-based culture specifically, like all over Asia, right? Um, once you become a sex worker, even if your family were the ones that sold you into it, you're no longer, you're an untouchable. You're an untouchable by everybody. It's, it's shame-based. Uh, here, when, when we look at, at creating drug addictions um, for these young women and young men, um, it's not just women that are trafficked. Um, you know, the here the, the shame is the drug it's the addiction it's the it's that next hit and it's much easier to keep control over somebody that way 92 percent of women that get rescued out of sex trafficking end up back in the red light districts 92 percent wow and the reason for that is 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 how do they find employment they have no training they have no education they have nothing to restart with and no one 
and this is a horrendous thing to say, the perception is that nobody wants them because they're damaged goods or or whatever it might be. That's the that's the culture behind. It. I'm not saying that that's what I think, but that's the culture behind it. Hey, listen, there's a lot to get over, and the reality is, is those individuals that have have found themselves in that place need a new identity. That's what they need, and and we're pretty passionate about that new identity. I, you know, there's there's a lot for us. Uh, first off, you know, we can pay five times the average wage of a man in these places, so they get a new identity in their culture just by their value in the fact that they have a job. Oh, That's I step one. I see. Yeah, it's like it's like yeah. Say what you want. I make five times what you make. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're, they're it, it is. That's they're a balling. huge part. The second part of that is is kind of a is a spiritual part of this. Is our our faith drives us, um, and you know we believe that that Jesus can give them a new identity. You know, like inside, and and there's a depth to that. And so we do this connected with local missions. We do this connected with local safe homes. We do this with partners that are on the ground and involved every day in their lives. And I think that you have to build a new community and through that new community, you get a new identity. And so that's, you know, we're, we're trying to chip away at that 92% that get rescued and end up back in the same problem. You know, the, 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 the new identity that you're talking about is so important because we truly become what we think about and like what you, you are never going to be more than what you think of yourself. And if you cannot get those people to think about themselves differently and perceive themselves differently and, and give themselves a different value and even building the value system, they will go back, just like you said. Uh, but if you can give them that value, and financial is certainly part of it, uh, and I'm sure counseling and other things will help, but it's really – I mean that's everything, giving them a new value system of how they see themselves. Right. That's, I believe, the 100% difference maker of whether they go back or not. What What's the What's the receptiveness of being, like, told about Christianity and God and Jesus? Like, do do they have an under, like, how well do they accept it? Um, well, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, obviously, these countries that we work in are are closed to the gospel. It's it's not legal, right? <laughs> to share a lot of that. Um, but you know what, when you come alongside somebody and you love on them, you, you treat them with respect, you give them good work that they're proud of. Eventually they ask you why, why is this different? Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and to be able to have that opportunity out of a relationship of saying, well, here's, here's what's different in me. This is, this is where I, I get my identity from. Um, I'd love to tell you about it. It's, it's nothing that we shove down anybody's throat. We don't require somebody to agree with our faith to, to work for us ever. Right. But I tell you what, if you're hungry for a new identity and that's offered to you in any way, you better believe, you better believe they, they grasp for that. I, and, I, um, is, is, so. is there any specific stories um, where you were able to kind of, you were definitely know someone got saved? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Tons. And I can give you, this is a really cool. We were doing, we we're doing a film project and um, I want to be careful about saying where and who and, and some of those things. So we're, we're in the middle of a red light district and we're filming in this, this uh, clinic that's in, that was a bunch of women that were rescued. They went out and got certified and trained. They came back in, they started a clinic in the middle of the red light district for women that were getting beat up at night. Okay. And they would go out in this very dangerous location with cards that say there's help and there's hope no faith basis whatsoever behind them so they're telling us their story and at the end they, we go around and i introduce myself uh, to them but i do it to nepali and uh, miranam kafi jiho and they just they exploded they exploded they're, they're dancing they're crying like we can't calm them down i have no idea what's going on <laughs> so i asked the interpreter i said what's what's going on and she's she settles him down and, and says, Hey, you know, what 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 about what about Jeff? They go, seven women came to us one night, had to get cleaned up. We sent them all for their first day of work, it was our first day of training. They all came and they said, We couldn't believe it. We were treated as equals, we were loved like daughters. We were given good work and I'm paid five times the wage of a man. And so when they would go out and hand out the cards before, the, the gals would hand back the card and say, who would pay me more 
that wouldn't treat me worse. I am like the garbage pushed out to the curb and lit on fire every morning. Now, these seven women have come back to this district and said, hey, they're, they're, let me tell you about it's real. Hope. I let swear me, <laughs> found it. And and now they've got thousands of young girls saying, when will Coffee G hire me? When will there be a job available for me? Um, You're like, I got to sell some lures. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just it. Right? Yeah. Like, that's, that's the thing. Our thing is, we, you know, and, and we can talk about this story. But the, here's the reality that we found, especially in fishing. Right. Like. Story might give us 10 percent increase on on volume or pricing right but innovation that's a 40 percent step up just just straight up business numbers we believe though as people discover our story what we're doing how we're doing it not only does it catch more fish because it's more innovative of, of products um and more environmentally friendly uh but they're loyal right our our clients are loyal i think we have a 87 89 percent return rate on on you know each of our customers um, because A, the product works, but B, because they know that it, they're able to support what we're trying to do. Right. We're doing it. Right. It is. Neat. So, yes. 200, 200 young ladies so far. We've, we've been able to help and our goal is 20,000. So we got a long way to go. Wow. Yeah. 200 is a lot of lives though. You know, it, it it's something too, like when you're holding one of the lures in your hand and you think about the journey that the lure has gone through to get to you, it's supply chain. You're like. Jeez, like I wonder. I wonder which and one of the, the twenty puts this together. Who created it? Yeah, yeah. Who put this together, and and how different is her life now? And you know what was her story? And you kind of get that connection to it. That's different. Um, thank you for doing this. I, I I'd like to talk about too is the product itself, um, and sure. why it's so innovative. So we got an opportunity to use the jigs in Florida. We found red tide as we find everything that's bad when we're out fishing, <laughs> uh, but. Um, <laughs> And that definitely slowed our progress. But what was interesting to me was I was using the jigs and the way that the hook is set up on the jig, it's able to move up and down freely, giving yeah. almost everything a more realistic look, but also made it so if you needed to, you could replace the hook, which yeah. is good and bad because it's like making a, a really great product and you're like, you need people to continually buy it, but the, it's like good that it'll last, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the jigs and then we'll get into, you know, the flies that I know you want to talk about. <laughs> oh, no, it's good. We can talk about jigs all day long too. Cause you know, it's really a combination of passions, really like the materials that are on those jigs are materials we actually developed for the flies. So I'll, I'll start there because it's, it's interesting. So the, the synthetic materials that we use in flies and jigs and, and all that, um, the dye process they go through, right? So I'm looking at this from the perspective of, we just rescued some people out of a really bad spot. I really don't want to put them in a spot where they're handling toxins like lead and battery acid. Mm -hmm. And so uh, first thing that we did is start looking at the mylars and acetates. Um, the other products in the industry use battery acid and water to open the pores of those plastics. And then they put in toxic dyes on top of that. And then they dip it in fresh water and it traps those dyes inside of those plastics. Okay. okay. That all flushes to our water treatment plants. No filtration required. So we came up with a way where we use in, instead of a fire-based heat, which is inconsistent, you're talking about plastics that are microns thick, right? So that they can move easily. Um, so we had to manage temperature. We were able to use citric acid instead of battery acid. And because of that, we we're also I know citric acid is okay because it's in all my food. <laughs> exactly. exactly. If you can get it on your gummy bears, it can't be too bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so so this this idea of like how can we make this more safe for our customers or or, or rather for for our staff um, kind of translates into how do we make it more safe for our own waterways? There, there are things. Hey, if you're not losing lures, you're not fishing, right? <clears throat> like you're not if you're not down in the rocks and the junk where you're losing lures. You're, you're really not fishing. So that set us off to how do we solve the lead problem? Um, numbers are arranged all over the place in the reports, but something like 40,000 40, metric tons of lead are left in our fresh waterways in the U.S. every year. You know, this is a hilarious I know exactly thing where you're, gonna go. you're bringing up because we had a conversation on, Huge the, fight. on the podcast oh. a few weeks ago about- uh, It's like a year ago now. Was it? Yeah. 
what, time flies. Well, anyway. Anyhow, yeah. it was a, it was an argument about how much lead is lost in our waterways just from fishing alone because <clears throat> originally the conversation started with uh, lead shotgun rounds or lead ammo versus uh, the. Non, yeah, the, non-toxic the, the, ammo. Yeah, there was a there was an argument to it though, that because it wasn't working out because the whole conversation started with how impactful is lead shot in the environment mm-hmm. in general, yes. and then yes. it was well if lead shot was what is used across the board still meaning even for ducks and geese and stuff like that would there be more lead in the environment because of that or because of fishing lures. Now, I 100% and stand by this, went towards the shot. I believe that every shotgun pull, you're just spraying so much out there, and I just don't think you lose as many jigs as, I mean, I go through boxes of shells every time I'm out duck hunting. You're only allowed six I ducks, but you got to hit the darn things. I think it's lures. Ryan thinks it's lures. Anyhow, there, there's no proof. Interesting. I mean, if you fish, if you fish Texas and Carolina, right you're throwing a quarter ounce at a time how often in a day out are you leaving lead on the bottom of the water but that's the thing quarter ounce your core you would have to shoot four you would have to lose four jigs in order to get one shotgun pole but way more one people ounce. fish but we, oh. but we aren't allowed sh- shot over water with lead yeah but we de- we live in a hypothetical world where we argue. This is what we do. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It's just an uh, argument. <clears throat> um, you know, here's here's where the argument would fall down. Uh, the ratio of bird hunters to fisher to, to anglers. Um, I don't know the number on the bird hunting licenses. Maybe you do, but I can tell you it's 52 million adult fishing licenses sold every year in the U.S. Maybe they're and using worms. <laughs> <laughs> If you were to take all of sporting goods in the U.S., you know fishing is only number two to jogging. Oh wow! Um, Who the hell wants to jog over more than fishing? Running? More than fishing? Doesn't make any sense? Jog right wild. into the water, then you know. <laughs> A whole new category, but you could take all of golf and tennis and double it. You wouldn't equal fishing. I don't think it's the same for bird hunting. Yeah, there's a lot of bird hunters out there, but, I, but it's not everybody that has a bass pond in their backyard. But every bird hunter is so much more impactful than a fisherman because every shot is four times what you'd probably lose in two fishing trips. So it would take so many. It's a it's an argument that's never going to get. Yeah. You know, but that, that, so, are there more doors or are there more wheels? Yeah, well, that's, hey, a, good, that's a good question. What do you got on that? Do you, you think there's question? more doors or more wheels in the world? Ooh. And really think about <laughs> it. You're sitting on a chair right now. Is there four on that thing? But man, every house has got. No, our, we're talking about any kind of wheel. Mm-hmm. Anything. I think it's a wheel. I think it's doors. Even poor people have cars. They just might not have a house. <laughs> <laughs> well, every car has four doors. But then you go to two a, doors. But then you go to a storage unit. And it really just <laughs> knocks the yeah. average back. Got a lot of cars with only two doors, and he's he's right. Like you know, in my my office, we have four doors, but every one of our seats has five sets of wheels. Plus, you so, got, plus you all drove there. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And, and a two-door truck with four wheels. So, Oh, I didn't even think about the doors on cars. Mm-hmm. There's just as many doors on my truck as there are wheels. Mm-hmm. Everything gets evened out fast that way. Yeah. <laughs> Trust isn't built in a day. It's built over time. The early hours and the late nights. It's built by doing the work and pushing the limits every day. Because the promises we make are the promises we were built to keep. The Greenway Outdoors is brought to you by Ram Trucks. Built to serve. Motor Trends Truck of the Year for the third year in a row. And by Bass Pro Shop and Cabela's. Your adventure starts here. Tracker Boats. Fish the finest. And buy these other fine sponsors. I don't know. Anyhow, this is beside the subject. Yeah. I, I, I do. Well, you know, there's lots of other debates around this too. Like, does lead leach? Well, go take a basic chemistry class. Lead leeches, right? Like, Exactly. And you know what? Um, so we're partnered with Boss Shot Shells, who you are going to love this company too. I don't know if you, you do – 
hunt uh, or shoot guns, but Bosch, if you're ever putting a shotgun load in your gun, it better be a boss because they they understand these philosophies and that sort of thing too. And Brandon, the guy that started the company, is a mad scientist when it comes to this sort of thing. And we were talking about lead the other day. And did you know if you shoot a lot of bird hunters, they shoot seven and a half shot, which would be considered like really, really small pellets. If a, it only takes one of those seven and a half shots for a bird to eat that lead to over a two week period roughly die from that one from that, that from one consuming pellet. that one pellet and yep. what what does that mean and if every trigger pull how many I don't know how many shot are in a seven and a half but it's over a hundred oh, pellets I would say um, I don't know. it's 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 a lot that's going into the environment and also is like we we're talking about it my turkey um, that I got this past Saturday made a great shot on it but it was really close some of the pellets went into the breast meat and I you know dug them out or whatever no big deal but using boss it was tungsten so yep. the good news is there was no there was no lead sitting in that meat but like you said lead leeches but do you really want lead going through your meat like you're not even supposed to use it for paint do you really want it in your meat and do you really want it in your waterways the same way but I wanted to make that plug for boss simply because they've innovated so much they uh for their um for their waterfall loads, they use copper plated bismuth. Um, yeah, gotta plate it. That's yeah. the key. Yeah, because uh, to make yeah. it, and it's almost as dense as lead at that point. And it's far more effective than steel. Um, so if, if you put mad scientists on it like you and like Brandon, you can come up with these great ideas that are very innovative, that are super effective, that you don't have the, um, you don't have to be polluting the environment with lead and that sort of thing. You had just indicated strongly towards plating it what what's the what's the science behind that so uh bismuth is a unique metal um it's it's specific gravity is 9.8 whereas lead is 11.3 so you got about a 10 percent difference in density there tungsten as you mentioned is a 19.4 depending on purity up to 19.7 it's okay. nice not cheap though but yeah that's the key is is you're looking at bismuth is about the same cost as lead um and at five and a half six dollars a pound whereas tungsten's 95 dollars a pound the other problem with tungsten is you've got to get it to six thousand degrees fahrenheit to hit a fluid state in other words to form it so the only ovens that can do that commercially right now are in china so that's really where you're stuck um getting that produced um so the other kind of key thing is is that bismuth forms in a crystalline form it's the only metal that expands when it freezes uh, so it's it's more like water. And the reason why I say you have to plate it is it shatters like glass very easily. So you'd be shooting dust out the end of your barrel if if you shot straight bismuth. Interesting. It, it just can't hold up to the compression. I remember the year that we went from lead to no lead in, in bird hunting. I, I used to do cast and blast trips out in the Northwest. And, um, you know, guys are shooting the, the ends off their $3,600 shotguns because all we had was steel as a solution in that first season every you know and it doesn't compress like lead does so everybody's got their full choke on and they're shooting steel shot and watching the whole end of their barrel go across the lake yeah i mean right? and then they started putting on the on the choke tubes you know no steel shot you know because yeah. of that yeah and steel so, I, the density is so much lower too that it doesn't have that downrange carry that's right it just doesn't. Whereas, whereas bismuth will give it to you. The copper plating's nice because it holds everything together. It's a great way to do it. Yeah. Um, and it gets you close. You have to oversize to make up for your weight difference, right? You're you're looking at a ten percent. You know, visually you can't tell. But that was the same thing for us. We didn't want people handling toxic products. We didn't want things left in our water. So that's why we started looking away from lead uh, to create kind of our own alloy for the jigs. But like lead, no paint adheres to it. Right. So everybody's fished their jigs and you're tossing them out because they're all chipped up after dragging across the bottom a few times. Um, so it's not just the loss. A lot of guys would just be like, hey, there's these are chipped up jig heads. They cut them off and chuck them off in the lake. They don't even bother taking them home. Right. So, you know, we, we really wanted to address that issue. The way that, that we encase it is with a high density polyethylene plastic. So what we ended up with is almost like a Teflon coating. Uh, for that bismuth as it drags over the rocks it slips it doesn't grab um one of the other things i'm trying to remember who it was is a youtuber did a series on tungsten weights and when they hit rocks in the bottom it scares the fish the tink is too unnatural and 
Sorry there. It is a very um, different sound. I very different sound. And he showed bass. He showed salmon um, just taking off as soon as it hit a rock. Yeah. And But with ours, it's just this soft thud. It actually brings them in because it sounds more lifelike. That's and, super cool. You know, it doesn't stick to oyster bars, which is key. If you fish, if you fish for redfish at all, yeah, um, your digs all day long to those oyster bars, and that's where the fish hang out. Uh, this, you just got to get bow your boat over. It slides right up. It doesn't doesn't wedge in uh, to those oysters the same way. And so we we looked at it and said, you know, when we went from lead to steel and shot, which is a perfect example. It wasn't a better solution. It was the only solution. It was it was like trying to you know the world's going vegan and I got to eat vegan bacon like it, nobody's going to buy vegan bacon until that's the only option and right. nobody really is going to right like it just doesn't make sense sure so so you've got to look at it from a how do we outperform the standard how do we innovate in a way that gets us in front of what a lead lure can do and that's that's all of our you know we're talking about jigs we got you know we're doing bullet heads for texas and carolina rigging we're doing spinners we're doing you know ned rigs and all that kind of stuff but um, yeah, the idea is how do we how do we outperform lead, and that's kind of how we landed where we did. And then that the last piece to that is that hook is disconnecting the hook. So the geometry is is all bad in a jig. Like the best thing is you know that everybody that's ever fished has tossed a jig. They are an effective way to do it. If you fish soft plastics, hair jigs, you name it, you're putting bait behind it. Whatever you're getting it down, it's on the drop. The fish always grabs. Right. Like these, these are the things that we know about jigs. Here's the bad thing about a jig. They're also the most likely way to lose a fish in the fight. And the reason is, is the longer the shank is between the eye where you tie in and the point of the hook, it works like a lever against you. So if you think about this, you're up on top of the water, the fish is grabbing. I don't know if this video is going to be part of the record, but it is. you can imagine in their mouth, right? As you pull up, you're literally pulling the hook out of the set. Right. It's right. leveraging again. So by us putting in that trailer wire that's between the hook, it allows us to use a short shanked hook so that you create a hinge at that point instead. And it, it's going to keep more fish. I uh, recently went down to Port St. Joe, went out with a guide. We're fishing nothing but our jigs and we're running them behind poppers and we're running them across the bottom. And we, he's like, holy crap. We have brought more fish into the boat than I've ever done in my entire career. We're bringing in bonnet head shark, lazy lady fish, lizard fish, the fish that normally take off with your lures because they, their teeth are so sharp. They can't get through that mono coated stainless steel trailer wire that we have. Right. So it sets that hook a little bit further back, allows you to, to keep the teeth away from your line. Um, and because it can flex and pivot, it stays, it stays set once you set it. That's super cool. Yeah, I was I was looking at them like Granger Smith looking at a walleye. I was just analyzing <laughs> this thing, and uh, we took Granger Smith fishing, and he was really looking down the mouth of the fish, very fascinated. But I was looking at the jig the exact same way. Is like, how does that? And then uh, um, it was kind of funny. I was so mad that you know that's what you remember the morning whenever we slept in because it was supposed to be thunderstorms and stuff like that, and then it wasn't that bad. But Jeffrey went out in the backyard and he cast in the canal catches a fish on one of these jigs, doesn't take a picture, doesn't tell nobody, just let it go. <laughs> I'm like, I want to beat you senseless. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's total Jeff move. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, but analyzing it, how it worked, talking about the sound, talking about how the hook works, you can start to see why they're so effective. What about the flies? Same same story. We, we use the same materials. We're now starting to do weighted flies with the bismuth. Um, there's yep. a nice little, um, and you know, again, is, is environmentally friendly. Doesn't have to be woke. Doesn't have to be politically correct. It's what we need for our environment, for my grandkids to go fishing in waters that aren't, you know, totally lead filled. Right. right. Um, like Flint, Michigan, but, but we can do it and, and we can do it better. It's not like Turkey. It's, it's not like vegan bacon, right? Like it's, it's actually, we can outperform what, what it's, the standard is. It's the is. perfect alternative. And it's so funny too, because new inventions or processes like this, it's like, why, why didn't we think of that 30 years ago? Why, why is this just now a thing? 
Right. <laughs> at, at, the best ones always seem like the simplest answers, right? Do you, do you find, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface it, this question with a little bit of a story, but my question is, do you find that you're getting a lot of pushback from people that are, they're very, 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 very careful not to be woke, which obviously we're not woke, but do you find like people are like real like standoffish? Like anytime you say anything about the environment that might help it or anytime you're innovating a product like this that you, you're getting kind of like a weird vibe from people on that? Every once in a while, you know, we're really clear that like, hey, listen, we're just we're just trying to do it right. You know, we're not we're not trying to be politically correct here. I uh, I say that because like I was um so Boss Shot Shells has a fan page. And Brandon, the owner, that's he like does a lot of interacting on there with people. And one of the things they have a new product called the War Chief, and they're using a new wadding that they're actually making themselves, and it's really innovative. And it's got uh, an additive to it that basically, when it goes into the ground, microbes and things like that can eat it over time. And over time, it will get it, you know it'll break down and uh, and go away. Now, the problem with that was is a lot of the competitors, they would make wads that were supposedly would break down in the environment very easily and quickly. The problem is that coming out the end of the gun, they would like disintegrate fast, right? Um, and they just weren't good enough products. Uh, and Boss was working hard to develop something that was. And now with this War Chief, that the wadding is incredible. It's super. It's better than all the other competitor waddings, and on top of that, it has this additive to it that w once it's in a microbe-rich environment, it'll begin breaking down over time. It just takes a little bit longer. And I saw some of the comments on there like, "None of this woke stuff," blah blah blah, and people like attacking them for saying. And the one guy was like, "Well, can I get it without that?" You know, it's like, and their their reasoning. I guess they do have a little bit of an argument. Is like some of the competitors that have made products that were supposedly able to break down. They would find out that on the shelf, they that it would break down. You know what I mean? So you had to shoot the shells within a year or two, otherwise it started to go bad. Whereas with these, it won't break down until it's in a microbe rich environment. Anaerobic. Anaerobic. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, until it's in that environment, it won't start breaking down. But I'm seeing like people are like hesitant because they're like, "Whoa, that sounds woke. That's good for the environment. I'm out. No thanks." You know this and that. And the people that tend to agree with us, say politically or religion wise and that sort of thing sometimes are the guilty ones of that i know i you know you you wouldn't believe some of the some of the facebook texts i've gotten and, and stuff <laughs> hey you know why don't you create jobs here in america and be an american and you know you're doing all this stuff overseas you know like uh, yeah you, you're gonna get it meanwhile Here's you're the literally deal. saving <laughs> lives <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, uh, I don't know. It'd be I, like doing yeah. a mission trip to Africa and then people being like, you could have helped here, man. That's messed yeah. up. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> exactly. I might as well not do it. When you go environmental, like you get lumped into something. And, and you know, here's the deal. I, I think that especially for those of, that, that claim to profess Christ, right? The first job given to us in the Garden of Eden was creation care. Like it was given to us. Not the granola eaten hippies right. that we outsource, like, just like <laughs> somebody else, right? So I think that it's important for us that you know, living our faith that we live out the first job given to us. I also, I it's a really fascinating debate. And again, this you got to geek out hard when you start going here. When you're talking about wads, you're talking about the same basic product, the same discussions I had to have in the plastic we used to go over the abysmal, right? Because here we are, we're using plastic products again, and you know. Now you're just putting plastics in there. What do you think is better? And this is the debate. You ready for this one? You, you guys can have like five episodes on this one right now. <laughs> so, is it better to create a product that lasts longer in the waterway or one that breaks down faster? We're talking about plastics. What do you think would be better for the environment? Breaks down faster. Yeah. Right. Except that's the problem. The real problem that we have with plastics is microplastics that we're finding in the livers of fish and then in they ourselves. Because then they can consume so, it. So what we do is we put biodegradable structures in the plastic resins that break down, right? They're, they're a plant-based resin that, that, that breaks down in the water. So you're going to have a limited life on that product, right? You get it wet, you use it. You're not going to want to go use that the next time you go out because it started to disintegrate. 
Um, the other piece of that is, is it breaks into microplastics faster. So is it better to have something stay solid or is it better to have it go into literally it's like, it's like aerating it for the fish. Yeah. That's so interesting. I, yeah. That's up to the bait. Yeah. Cause you, solid better. yeah, I would say solid then for sure. And I, I felt like, you know, like when your grandma's asking a question, you feel like it might be a trick question. You know? Yeah. 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 I, I had the feeling, but I played along. Well, it's, it's like in our thought process to think like that. Cause the pitch was always, well, this breaks down in five years and then it's done. Whereas your water bottle takes 300 years. So they've taught us to think like, oh, the faster it breaks down, the better. Right. That's true. It's not that simple of a solution. It, it really isn't. I think the fascinating stuff that I haven't gotten to play with yet, and I, I want to, is is the mushroom-based stuff. The mushroom that actually consumes plastics. They're using it out in the Pacific Ocean right now. They found that shiitake mushrooms consume polys. Interesting. They actually, they actually totally take it back to its natural state. No um, kidding. You know, there's so much that we haven't explored on this and, and how do we integrate that so that that's in the product, you know, but, but I, I think that that's just fascinating because I want to keep my waterways clean, not because I want to approve of somebody else's agenda. Um, I think agendas can be good and I think they can be bad. Right. Sure. But I think we're left with, but what's my influence? What's my decision? I'm the one making the decision as to what products are going into this. Um, so what do you, what do you see as the future of the company now and where can people get the products? Yeah. So, um, right now, walmart.com and anglerstradingpost.com, uh, are both carrying those jigs, those products, um, zag.fish. You can buy a lot of the fair flies and Wasatch if you're on the fly fishing side with us. Um, those are there and, uh, we'll be on shelves at Walmart next April. We're pretty excited about that. Congratulations. And, and, you know, we can talk about this. This whole political agenda stuff, Walmart just came out with their gigaton. No matter where you stand on the organization, the gigaton mandate. I don't know if you've read that. It's fascinating. Um, they're, they want to remove a gigaton of carbons in in their supply chain over the next till by 2030. So what would a gigaton be? Like what is it like a, a million lot. tons? Is there a measurement? Uh, even bigger than that, I forget. Dang, so it's yeah, a giga, dude. A lot of them. <laughs> it's a gigawatt. ETS, yeah, big number. Um, Shit ton, they but, call it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, kind of like a metric ton, just bigger. Yeah. Um, so, so we are the the first ones in the fishing industry to meet those mandates by 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 just natural approach. There's no plastic in our packaging. It's all recycled paper. It's non toxic inks. Or like, hey, if we're gonna do this, let's just do it. Let's let's do it right. As long as we can do it better than what currently exists, right? Like, not just do it to say that we did it. I'm, I'm not looking to greenwash anything, right? If we're not doing it for for real, I don't I don't want to claim it. So um, because of that, you know, Walmart's pretty excited about seeing our products. Awesome, uh, help that's super cool. Help that mandate. Well, we appreciate you coming on. We appreciate you telling your story, and we appreciate what you're doing, especially for those 200 women so far, and hopefully yeah. 20,000 in the future. Uh, you'll be able to start your own country. A bunch of happy people running around. <laughs> yeah. As I understand it, you guys have some crowdfunding going on. What 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 exactly is that about? Yeah. So so pivot at a at a site called EquityVest.org. Uh, you can look us up there. We have a, a crowdfund that we're running just for pivot, and um, we, we want consumers, we want the people that get behind Pivot to get to own a piece of it and, and go for the ride with us. And so uh, go take a look there. It's equityvest.org. Look up the Pivot offer that's there and and uh, come along for the ride with us. If you've ever wanted to own a piece of a fishing lure company, this is a great way to do it. And yeah, that's for sure. Now, now you know the story behind it. Go buy some of the products. Get some of the Get some of the products. Make sure you believe in it. That's what we did first was we had you send some out. And like I said, we're, we're not even officially partnered. We just uh, like the idea of working with you. You sent us some awesome jigs. And uh, I got to give them a try, and they actually work, according to Jeffrey. And uh, even through Red Tide, he was able to get some fish on it. So that's a that's a good sign. But also, you know, if you want to own a piece of it and kind of get behind this way of thinking, you know, that opportunity is out there for you. Well, I we appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Kyle. It's, it's a real treat. Absolutely. We hope you have a great day, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to watch your journey. All right. Thanks, guys. Yep. Take care.